Miriam, we are delighted to have you uh, join us as our guest today. And I'm very excited about the chance to pick your brain because I have been uh, excited by both your work in fire ecology, but also your ability to, to take that work and turn it into a, a, a graphic, a visualization that are, are, are extremely functional. Um, I, I see like sometimes people, they, they think like, wouldn't it be nice to have a picture to go with this? And like, um, okay, a picture of maybe something on fire. Um, but you, as you've been working in this area, have been developing a series of graphics um, and they are both uh, a wonderful to look at, but also really help explain complex and nuanced things. A um, little bit more background about uh, uh, Miriam. Miriam has been working for a long time in fire ecology and helping communities kind of grapple with the increasing fire frequency and our fundamental relationship with fire itself. And um, one way that that has been done is that um, some years ago, I had I had a, a, a privilege of uh, being in the field on some cultural on a cultural burn project where there were controlled burns that were happening in northern California forests with uh, native tribes and foresters and people who were being trained about um, lighting controlled burns and it was this massive community event and you arranged a a bunch of uh, nature journalers to be embedded in the middle of that. Um, you got us all training in, in how to kind of uh, deploy an emergency fire shelter and got us all, um, uh, you know, fire protective safety gear. So we're going around in yellow shirts and green pants. And it was an amazing experience. Maybe we just sort of start with, just talk a little bit about that experience and your, um, and the inspiration for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, just, I guess, a little more background. Um, most of my career was, um, I started as a wildlife bi biologist with the federal government, kind of bouncing between the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. And then I um, moved into um, fire management um, because early in my career as a biologist, I would do collateral duty firefighting. So I'd fill in with the crews and do firefighting and prescribe fire. And then um, with that combination of knowledge, I moved into some positions in fire management. And um, at the end of my career, it was 2019 when we had that um, event that you're talking about, Jack, where um, I had, I think it was 2017 when I became introduced with nature journaling. I'd always used visuals and done artwork, but I never really understood nature journaling. And once I did, and mostly through Jack's neighborhood on Facebook and that sort of thing, I, I got it. I thought it was just a plain air practice at first of doing art in nature. Um, and then I realized it's a whole other tool. And so I wanted to, within my job, learn how to use nature journaling to educate and communicate with people about fire. And so um, not only was I just kind of practicing and taking it on and doing it on my own personal time, I tried to coordinate some events where nature journalers would come and be there in the, in the environment, seeing fire and talking about it and trying to journal. And so that particular workshop even though we had prepared a pretty extensive agenda, we kind of threw it out and just winged it, mostly because Jack and a lot of experienced nature journalers came along and we just figured it'd be better to just kind of free flow that sort of thing. But that was in the Klamath Mountains in Northern California. And um, they use a lot of fire and they work very closely with the tribes doing these prescribed fires according to their um, their goals and prescriptions. And so it was fantastic, um, not only having experienced nature journalers there, um, and it was kind of developed with Jack and Robin Lee Carlson and myself kind of scoped it out and kind of figured out what we were gonna do and how to um, walk through that. But um, a big part, I believe, in learning about a complex system like fire is to realize it's not just the flames, it's not that fire event. Um, fire is a 
it's a process. It's a chemical reaction. And so what goes into that is more important than just the fire. And so knowing how to look at the environment and how to observe those complex trends and interactions, to me, that is the key to observations and journaling about fire. The actual fire, you're taking what you learn from all that pre-fire, that fire environment stuff and applying and relating that. And then there's a lot of stuff you can do after fire, but you can see that that's a, this complex environmental system that unfolds over time. And so there's um, using data visualization really helps with that because there are a lot of things that you just don't see when you go out and just look. And so I'll kind of through, I have a bunch of slides of examples. And so I'll first just talk a little bit about data visualization. And then um, I'll flip through quickly kind of some of those slides and examples and why I took a certain approach. And then I'll just kind of go through a bunch of examples quickly. And then Jack and or if the community want to go, I want to know more about that one. We can go back and talk through more of them. So um, was there more you wanted to talk about the TREX event, the prescribed fire uh, event? No. Um... I, I just wanted to thank you so much for your 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 work in this area. Understanding fire is is critically important to us. And I should say that as we are recording this, there is a large fire burning on Maui. Um, many people are 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 displaced by that, and uh, many wild habitats are that haven't seen fire like this in a long time. Um, it's a it is a uh, thinking about these things uh, is and and how we respond to it is is only going to become more important. And thank you for the work that you do. And we um, also just want to um, send a call out to all the the families and people who are displaced in Maui right now. And we know that this is a really difficult time. And we're sending you our best thoughts. Should I share my screen now? I think that's a great idea. Now, a question on this. Um, do you want to go through all your things and then have me um, share, uh, um, you know, at, ask to call back the things? Or as we're going along, would you like me to um, pepper you with questions about uh, what you're thinking for a combination? I run through it. I'll go in a little more detail on the like the first few of them. Um, and if you want to ask some questions there, but it, these can be so detailed that I think we could spend the whole time just talking on one or two slides. And so I'll go through them quickly. And then I think um, rather than me going into details on all of them, we'll go back to the ones that you feel um, make the most sense or you're most curious about. Does that right. work? Absolutely. Um, and so, so folks, as we're, we're, we're looking at these, what I want everybody to think about is not just, oh, that's how you would display that aspect of fire. But I want you to think about this. You're trying to communicate any idea, any idea. And um, you, we can take a look at what Miriam's doing here to help us think about how you can just take an idea and turn that into, uh, into a picture. So um, this is, the, the, the things we're gonna be looking at are not specific to fire ecology. This is a, a, a fundamental skill for the way we think on our nature journal pages and then when we turn around and try to communicate things to other people. So now I'll be quiet and go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, exactly. Thanks for clarifying that. This is definitely, um, in general, nature, the environment, observations. And so I just threw up a quick definition of data visualization from the internet, um, if people kind of want to wrap their brains around how it's looked at. But it's just, it's visualizing, it's a graphical representation of information and data, which is what were your observations, their information, it's data. Um, and by using these elements like charts and graphs and maps, these tools can provide um, a way to make this more accessible to see and understand things that are very complex, these trends, these patterns, um, and a whole lot of other stuff. So that's kind of a general definition. I kind of look at it different. Um, partly, I started doing data visualization in part because I'm not good in math and statistics, 
which a lot of people might think that's what you're doing is you're using these statistics and, and doing these graphs. Um, that is not just what it is. It is really a kind of a different way of seeing things in the environment that can be kind of more subtle and challenging, these changing elements. And so that's where I find data visualization really helpful. And so as I go through these slides, I'll be trying to kind of explain a little bit of what these bullets are here, but I think more about the relevance of the metadata to my observations. So I don't just want to add in you know, the location and the and the weather elements, and they're just sitting there like background noise. I want to kind of connect and tie them to what I'm seeing in my observations. It can be in the moment, and a lot of times I'll then go back through my journal and create these data visualizations after the fact, kind of combining mixed elements. But so I kind of, I try to think about what is important, what is the key metadata that relates to my observations. And sometimes it takes time, but you can also look at references like what I have or talk to people. These kind of workshops can help you think of what are the key metadata elements. Um, I also think that, and you'll see in my examples, uh, metadata, especially for data visualization, isn't just like one number, like 72 degrees Fahrenheit isn't all that meaningful to what you're seeing. It's usually a range of things, these thresholds of it's it's cold and that's range, it's warm, it's hot. And so um, thinking a little differently and you'll see how I do that. But all of those ranges can be kind of thought of on how they influence plants, animals, the environment, fire. So um, it relates very widely, very generally, because all living things are influenced by some of these key metadata elements. And um, I use a lot of comparisons and kind of look at trends. And um, one thing I focus a lot on is weather in context of climate change as well. And those all influence something like a system like fire. I also use a lot of this data visualization for helping to recognize and become aware of this in there. It's not just looking up the weather and putting it on there, but how do you physically connect and become aware of that so that you'll cue into it? So there are observation prompts kind of that I tie around this metadata. And then how you journal it, that what makes it a meaningful metadata um, visualization. And I like to think about what resonates with me. So my example, you may think, well, I'd rather tweak it and do it differently. And that's kind of what I think is really important is not necessarily to use the exact examples of others, but to think about what makes it meaningful. So just think about those as we go through. Now, this is a pretty, my typical, very crowded, very complicated, um, sloppy nature journal, but it's related to, I mentioned a lot about temperatures there. And that's one of the things that for metadata, that isn't always meaningful, that single number. And I, I don't resonate with numbers all that well. And so I like to find ways to make that resonate more with me. And you'll see in my upper, on the right page, on the upper right corner, I have this little funky little caricature of myself in this little colored box. And so um, that is an example of how that is like a very simple to me data visualization of that resonates with me because I used a color and I used a little picture of myself that I'm there experiencing and feeling the weather. So that's like a simple kind of thing. But as I'm going through my process and I've done it, I've tried to make that more comparable to different temperature ranges because how I experience um, temperatures and the weather can be changed based on my mood, based on how I'm feeling. But I found a lot of research, and even the National Weather Service has some cool information about which temperature ranges um, you can really experience and feel differently. And I won't go into too much detail, but I also think of coming up with color codes that are relevant and that you can integrate in different ways. And this is just integrated into some kind of different expressive sketches of kind of a, eh, I don't feel that wonderful in the colder temperatures. Um, the warm, dry temperatures, I feel pretty good. I've got a smile. Hot temperatures, I don't like. Frowny face. Um, you could do little, simple little smiley, frowny faces. You could 
caricature yourself. Um, just some examples of how to make it relevant and um, resonate with you. A little more on the color codes. I, I love colors and especially for temperature. It really, um, to me, I could just, like in that one example of the little upper right corner, I could just flip through my journal and look for the different color ranges and then look at my detailed observations and, and start to see relationships with, with different temperatures. And this was a um, insect temperature indicators. I think Julie Tennis shared an example of this a few years ago in the Nature Journal community. Um, and so I had kind of created my own color codes using some of those insect um, behaviors related to temperatures. The same color code though, it's kind of evolved to what it is right there. I can also overlay plant phenology and um, fire behavior because um, phenology changes within different temperature ranges. And so you can use that as a prompt or just include those colors in your journals with whether you're doing a diagram or a little symbol or you're, you'll see different ways I use colors. Um, and so I have the same color code, but I, have identified different little things to kind of remind me or to see relationships. I've done the same thing with relative humidity. And I know Roseanne Hansen um, has talked about how relative humidity, this thing that our bodies are not well adapted to recognize those different uh, ranges of it, but the sky color, um, you can tie that to um, relative humidity. And that is a neat way to then translate that over into some little visual graphics. So I have a little raindrop symbol and I use the color code for that daily observation. That moment, it was 40% relative humidity. But then I also like to have comparisons and it adds more context. If I show that relative humidity within the day, or I might do compare that with the historical average for the day, but that's a way to have a physical observation of something that we can't sense very well, uh, looking at the sky color, connecting it to relative humidity, and then creating a data graph that, um, to me, kind of resonates. So I've taken that same relative humidity color code, and I'm using it in a kind of a perpetual journal sort of thing. And in fire, we look at what we call it fine fuel moisture. It's just the, the dry grasses and leaves on the ground, which is what primarily carries fire. And when those things are dry, fire behavior, fire flammability, ignition potential is tied very strongly to relative humidity. And so um, I can go through and instead of just drawing the same dry, dry grasses, which could be all the way from summer through winter, that I'm seeing those same things. But if I'm adding my color code and then also adding my other sensory feelings of even though it's dead, it's still pliable, it bends, but when it gets to a lower relative humidity, it's gonna break and crumble. So it sounds, feels, smells differently. So I'm kind of integrating these different things into a data graph, but there's, there I'm using my colors as a background wash to my little ongoing observations and trying to kind of connect my brain to those colors. Because sometimes we relate to colors differently. Dark colors often we're relating to more moisture, but in the sky, it's actually um, a drier condition. So I'm kind of trying to reprogram my brain and this kind of thing. In this visualization here, and I'm gonna start moving a little quicker through some of these, I just wanted to show this um, little circle arrow thing here. To me is a data visualization that I use fairly often because it's easy, but I'm looking at grasses, those fine fuels over time. And the number of those grasses that are dry is really important for my observations. And so this type of little thing is a good way for me to kind of quickly show where I am in a phase of something. Um, you could also do a percentage graph, but that's just another example to me of kind of showing a process and a time of where you're doing something or what you're observing in those changes. And Another way of that same kind of information could be just some diagram sketches that are at different phases that are related to your metadata. So here I have a green phase when about 10% or less of the grass is cured or when it's dry. Uh, there's a green gold phase, a gold green phase, a yellow gold phase, but it's connecting metadata, your data with a visual. And I've got kind of a 
horizontal view of the top of the grass, looking at the overall percentage versus a vertical view of within the plants themselves, their percentage so of um, curing or how dried they are. This could also be your phenology phases as well. So it's just kind of another way to sketch out your data visuals. This is super complex, but I really learned so much from this um, data graph. And uh, when I first started getting into this, I spent an entire year journaling the daily weather. And I did a bunch of different kinds of visualizations, but I learned the most from this one. And this was kind of a, a weather climate graph where I used the climate for that area, those um, average um, high and low temperatures. And that's the middle line represents those averages for both high or low. It's just that that's the average point. And then my daily weather high and low were those points along that create the lines up and down. And I would put the actual temperature, I would use my color code, and then I would add some of the observations I was seeing that seemed like they were tied to weather. And I, I did this before I even looked up and learned about the insect thermometer and that sort of thing. And that triggered my curiosity to go, wait, okay, I'm just now seeing bees. So are they tied to temperature or what are they connected to? And so it kind of created this thinking process. And um, this also allowed me the very top bar of numbers and the very bottom bar are the record numbers. And so I noticed during my observation period, there was one point where it reached a new record. So I kind of replaced. So this was just really interesting for me to, it's not something I would continue doing all the time, but I did it for about three months and um, it really changed things for me on how I um, looked at things. And a lot of my graphics are things that I might do um, just for a month, maybe three months, and then it's helped me evolve my thinking, or I might create just like kind of a, a background reference because it's the climate. So I could just be able to look back and compare my observations with this. This um, is a kind of a, a similar looking at, I pulled this graph, or at least the, the basic data um, from a, one of the National Weather Service websites and um, for a particular area. And then I applied my color code. So I just traced over um, with my color code. So it, to me, resonated a little bit more. And then I wanted to tie the um, phenophases of trees. And I did a cup one for deciduous broadleaf trees and one for um, conifer trees. And then trying to kind of have a similar color code for when you might start to see those phenophases, phases and I, I would in the future as this is my kind of my reference and so as I go on in the future I would probably redo the color zones underneath the phenophases phases based on what I actually saw and then I could go back and compare to this kind of baseline one and this is very complex I won't go into too much of what this is but I want to sh show you that Part of my looking at the fire environment and weather and fire history, a lot of our records from way back before we had weather stations is um, calculated through tree rings. And the one sketch on the right was an actual, I cut out an actual sketch in one of my journals and put it in with this graph. I knew when this tree was cut down. And so I sketched it and that was it. And then I wanted to go back and think about, okay, so tree rings, the size of them and the size of the, the light colored area and the dark colored area change based on temperature and moisture each year. And so then I took an, one of those weather service graphs and integrated both the temperature and the precipitation for each year through the life of that tree, kind of trying to see if, oh, you know what? I'm actually seeing it. I'm seeing where you know, these mo certain moderate temperatures or high temperatures um, and precipitation levels are associating with those tree rings. So you can start to kind of elaborate on past observations by integrating some of this. And I'll just note the, the bottom precip precipitation rain graph, I like to flip flop it. Um, I'm kind of trying to find ways for stuff to jump out at me quickly and resonate. And I kind of think of 
precipitation influencing the soil and then plant life in the ground. So I flip flop mine. And here's another example where that's flip flopped. Um, I had the the kind of wide faded bands are the historic averages of rainfall over the season, and then the colored bars are that year. And so you could have your historic baseline that you've done as your background and then create new ones each year, or just as you're going through the year, keep going back and comparing. And what is kind of an interesting way to think about it, I was looking at fire season, but you could be looking at different animal observations, say frogs or salamanders, things highly influenced by rain and moisture. When are they really active? When are they coming out? And so you could then, if you're doing observations, um, in the future, you could use this or if you go look through what you've done and see where they fit into this range. So it's really helpful to make comparisons. <laughs> this was one of the things I did for that year of nature journaling weather. And I actually started with this before the climate graph. And I visually really love this. Um, I call it a fire weather wheel and it kind of plays on the phenology wheels. The outer ring are the daytime highs the inner ring are the nighttime lows. And I have both temperature, relative humidity and wind. The color is the temperature, the little dots are relative humidity and the chevrons are wind. But what was fun as I evolved what this looked like, my final version, which is what I would stick with, I had these little stems and leaves that came out from the circles. And this for me, I was looking at satellites to tell you where there's a hot spot that could be fire. It could be prescribed fire, it could be a burn pile, could be a wildfire. And I do look at that within a 50 mile radius of where I live. And so that's what the little leaves were on each were the number of hot spots because I'm wanting to see how fire is related to that weather condition. Um, and you can see the other element in here, these little red flags are the National Weather Service red flag alerts when they consider it to be fire weather. So like kind of comparing what the environment's telling me in my local weather versus what they're telling me. And so I added those to my graph as well. But you could be doing this for phenology of plants, insects, migrations, if you're trying to build a relationship and see it. So that's what this graph was trying to make connections and relationships. This is another one I did a long time ago. Um, actual, your typical data graphs of a line graph and a bar graph and a donut graph that um, were for the camp, the 2018 campfire uh, in Northern California. I wanted to kind of visually look at, um, there's a line graph for temperature and the dark and light or daytime and nighttime. Um, relative humidity and wind speed and compare that with the bar graph, which was <clears throat> fire growth in daytime and nighttime. And so just comparing elements, sometimes teasing them out, even just in your standard graphs, which I just did with an app on my iPad, um, you can piece together graphs, which can be interesting. Um, a little bit about wind, which is actually my absolute favorite um, data observation to look at. Um, I think most people are familiar with the Beaufort wind force scale. And it has those categories, those ranges that you kind of look for because just three miles an hour or just one exact, you know, wind speed isn't as relevant as a category of what you're seeing and experiencing. So I love to use the Beaufort wind force scale and I illustrated this version and tweaked it a little bit related more to fire behavior. And you don't always have to do the whole entire range, I actually target most of my wind observations to about 10 miles an hour, which is kind of in most, a lot of environments where fire behavior really starts to change. So I kind of target as you're hitting that, um, kind of that range in the Beaufort scale, the eight to 12 miles per hour. I'm kind of trying to really key into that. So I don't pay attention to the really high wind speeds, nor the lower, I kind of target in around there. So you can kind of focus your data. And here's just an example of, for me, um, trying to cue in so I'm more aware when I'm in the environment. I did my Beaufort wind force observations with the little wind speed and the little sketch. I'm also looking at past wind influences in the area that has influenced the shape of trees. 
And then I do, I tape over a vellum page of what I'm predicting the winds will change in the environment. So I can kind of see trends of things, but these are kind of different ways of different wind is influenced by so many different things from the landscape, the kind of vegetation, the weather. And so I like to layer, you know, I'm looking at one thing, I'm looking at wind in many different ways. And um, I'll just mention on this one, this is smoke columns and how smoke, the shape of it will change based on wind speed, which is along the columns and by atmospheric stability, which is on the left, the um, rows here and looking at changes over time. And so just to, I wanted this as to show you, you can use a table and do sketches in there and have your data along the bottom, which sometimes helps you think about things differently. Maps, another way to do it. Um, not only are you seeing spatial changes across the landscape of how big or widespread you can do movements or show um, different comparisons um, over time as for weather. This one, I'm still thinking about ways to use it, but I really liked the visual. And I was trying to think about time and observations, different observations important over different seasons. And so integrating these little mini calendars, which I could have enter, I could put something on the calendars in there. And then I have a little path around kind of leading through those seasons of what I'm observing, the changes in the grasses. And then other, I did this as a prompt. So I'll know to kind of key into certain observations, but you could go in after the fact and just add what you'd seen over this change of time. Um, this is elevation again is another metadata element a lot of people add, but by creating visuals and I also just use a straight up triangle sometimes when I want to be quick and put elevation points on there rather than just writing the elevation as the number. I'm visualizing it. This is a, a 3D landscape block, but I've color coded the different elevational zones and then I add illustrations of the key vegetation communities. So I'm seeing trends based on elevation, these changes of vegetation over a widespread landscape. And this is another elevational zone, kind of a little strip. So instead of doing a block landscape, you could do a little wedge and show your vegetation communities and then kind of write some of the differences and things you might see along those elevational gradients. <clears throat> this is really complicated and I really just want to show you this was used to be, it was just a table that wildland firefighters use to look at how dry vegetation will be based on the uh, amount of slope, the aspect, if it's north, um, south, east, west sort of thing, and the time of day, these multiple elements. And so I colored in where it's getting the most sun exposure, which is going to relate to when it's driest. But it was just a way to use a simple triangle with these different little wedges for each aspect and um, then fitting in your data within that in a visual way. And just a few more, I'm going to whip through some of these landscape ones. These are changes in wind based on the time of day within the same landscape. Oops. I went too fast. Um, and so you could have the same landscape and then you could potentially use vellum or something to trace over it and show changes um, over time. This is long periods of time looking at decades of time, which we call for a fire regime and how different parts of the landscape may burn at a different frequency. This was an attempt to visualize that. This was an attempt to visualize both um, seasonal and elevational changes of fire regime, what time of year that fires are typically occurring at different elevations. Um, this was kind of, I have those same landscapes that you see in a lot of, and if you looked in detail at those, you'd see differences of how the landscape looks, but I was keying into, there were different smaller activities, human activities going on over time. And really the arrow is, a big part of showing this over time that one of those data temporal elements along with those little visual sketches. Um, and here's just another showing a change on a landscape and a place looking at what the vegetation was originally and then if you did some work around your property, how it could look different kind of visualizing layers of changes. 
and um, this is the second to the last one, um, sounds, visualizing that. That's another data sort of thing that you can look at and you can have graphs like you see the fire acoustic frequency graph, which is what is often visualized, but I'm trying to use words and other little visuals like somebody whispering the little hand to the mouth or little descriptive things of it sounds like sparklers and um, little measurements and things like that. So integrating that, all of this is a combined data visual. And then this last example of um, kind of uh, ecoacoustic um, studies, um, I would want to look at different landscapes, those little flat squares in the bottom are different burn severities where a landscape burned at different intensities. And I was curious of what kind of different birds you might observe in those different areas or bees or other things. And so thinking about color codes, um, linking some of the different sounds in different areas, but you can add musical elements and that whole stuff. So I've rambled quite a while and I want to go um, and stop my talk and see if Jack, if you want to go back to any particular ones. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm, I, I am, I, I muted myself because over on my man, uh, my end, I was just making all sorts of whoops and oh, oh my God. So um, I really want to kind of play in these with you. And also um, the, uh, Oh, by the way, there's something there. If when Miriam publishes a book about her insights and field practices, I will be buying it and supporting her. Anyone else? Um, the uh, the it, I, I I we the, this this really is is brilliant work and so into this. Let let's just kind of swoop back to the start there. Mm -hmm. And um, go to that uh, that first yeah that one right there. Okay. Do you want me and to open it up or is this good? Open it up. Open it up big. Okay. So when I was looking at this, um, something that really struck me is your 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 idea of um, how to make this personally relevant. Um, not just to write down this is what I'm smelling, but there's a picture of you smelling. These, these these three different things, the smoky smell, the dry grass smell, the riparian wood smell. Um, there's a picture of you, of your ear, of, 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 of you with the, the heat around you. Like I sometimes have drawn in a little nose for smell, but it doesn't include me. And just, it just made me think about the way, like I've put temperature into things, but the temperature didn't include me. And this is such a, a, a profound way of making things personally relevant. Um, I just want to just, uh, could you reflect for a moment on sort of the impact you found of, um, of, of, of putting yourself into the journal like this? Yeah, like I mentioned, I feel like data should be meaningful if you're going to bother to put it in there and part of being aware and connecting is putting yourself in that and I do feel and I was like I have really tried to include little visuals of myself experiencing it and I feel like when I look because my pages can be very sloppy like you see and I could get lost in it if I'm trying to just look at a bunch of sketches and a bunch of words describing stuff but if I have a little visual of what the smell looks like with colors or that you know I can very quickly go and remember oh yeah I smelled it um, and the colors help accentuate that so yes for me it's just to physically connect and become more aware and, and part of that to me is having visuals that relate to my experience of that sense mm -hmm. The um, there's a couple, just a few other things. You are smearing blackberries, maple leaves, getting the the carotenoid pigments out of them, and the also a smear from um, is that a cottonwood or an aspen? Uh, I think it was an alder. An alder. So smears from the from the leaves themselves. Um, th this is really really 
fun. Just you know, kind of this this little, and and then you're you're also here kind of dropping out, kind of getting um, information. I'm guessing from a book or a website for the range of the bush tit. Um, but yeah. sort of giving yourself sort of a larger context. Um, this is really mentally exciting to me. And also the way that you, you know, the, the rising sun, there is, you've got a big box for it and it's, there's a little orange ball down in the bottom corner. I just, um, this is where, like, I think that this probably just comes after really doing these deep dives in visual thinking. This is delightful. And I just said, I see this, the, the genius of a page like this. And it's it's in the process, and it's also the this larger toolkit that you've given yourselves. Hmm. Um, let's let's bounce over um, another page. Which one did you like to see? Um, oh, we we sort of uh, let, let's just kind of go for a big slideshow, and okay. uh, just sort of continue our way down. Um, the, uh, again, this is this idea of, of data made relevant, data made relevant, and you're making it relevant to you, but, and, but then also what that means on, um, what that means on the, the fuel level, um, what this what this feels like on your on your on your lips on your skin and what that feels like in a pine needle um but this is yeah this is this is exciting Next let's slide. jump down another page insect yeah so this this made me so do you use this same color scale for a bunch of other things so when you're doing other kind of color things is there sort of one temperature scale that you usually use or is or are these colors specific for your insect temperature indicators this so i originally had a couple different color codes and realized that they actually kind of could all fit into one. So I use this exact same color range, color code for whether I'm looking at fire behavior, plant phenology, insects. So this is my one color code because um, yeah. it, it's all kind of related on how plants change and what insects, you know, how they adapt. I mean, there's subtle differences, but in general, this works. So. I've put in this one just for insects, but it's the same color code for phenology and everything else. Mm. See, that's really, really useful. So you, then, then you have this color code in your head and whenever you are coloring something, representing color, like let's say there's a little glow around you um, and it's, uh, 90, it's 96, you're gonna be putting red in there. Um, and just so as you flip through your, your book, temperature becomes a color. It becomes something that you can, you can see more. I think this is really fun. And the question about this, with the wind speeds, you were focusing on areas where um, the wind speed changes made more of a difference. Um, in this are your set points. I'm noticing like it goes from 32 to 33 to 55 to 62. Um, am I correct? You're not going at regular intervals. I think, are you going at intervals that are um, kind of sort of biologically relevant? Yes, yes. Absolutely. So these are where um, you'll see big changes. So yeah, so it's not like each is a, you know, five or 10 degree difference to the next category. These are temperature ranges that are biologically relevant. Uh, see, 
you did that with the wind, you're doing that with temperature. So you're, you're not just paying attention to the number, you have a scale in your head and on your paper that is relevant to the questions that you're asking. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. That's, that's not a little thing. That's a huge cognitive leap to, 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 to do that. Ah, <laughs> um, this is, this is fun. Um, I, 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 I'm having a hard time talking because I'm smiling too much. Um, let, let's bump over to another page. So this is relative humidity associated with the color of the sky. Yeah. But use, so it's colors again, but it's a, more of a blue scale um, on what you'd actually see, but it relates to a data point that you'd need. Um, and that, the, you know, I could have had just like one color for the light to medium and one color for the very light, but I broke it out again in the, not only where there's a color change, but they're biologically um, environmentally relevant ranges. Um, so, you know, sometimes I, I can't differentiate the medium color blue skies very well from the dark. Uh, but if I am also like, I might just have a, in my sky, just a, a, some random medium blue color. But if I took relative humidity measurements, um, I can use a little slightly more specific one and, and know to pay attention to even more subtle color changes. So it's kind of this way of enhancing my observation skills and, and thinking a little bit more, or maybe thinking about what else could be influencing why it, there could be smoke. And so maybe the humidity might have been a, a slightly um, different color blue, but because of other particles, it might be lighter. But so it helps me think about those really complex systems. And again, we're seeing relevant scales. So you're, you're not just taking intervals but you're you're choosing where these things are biologically significant, where things change fire behavior, where the system, where there are tipping points in the system for these different cutoffs. And I also like that, like it, in in my head, I would think more humidity, more blue. But mm -hmm. this is flipped the other way because that's what you because of the effect of water vapor on scattering light. When it is less humid, you see bluer skies. Yep. And, and you kind of have to retrain your brain for that. That's kind of why I was uh, the one of the next slides. You know, to me, when I just glance at it, it and you might decide not to use this color code for some other things because your brain will continually see it as moist, or you just retrain your brain to see that color as a dry color. So there's kind of some choices in thinking about when to use them. I like this idea of retraining your brain. Yeah, this is this is fun. That's right. Yeah, you 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 see that sort of dark uh, the, on the July fifteenth um, uh, feels crunchy and breaks, and we see the dark blue around it. That's right. My my brain wants to say like, oh, that got a bunch of soaking rain because of all the blue around it, because we have this sort of weird so idea might... that wa water is blue. Right. And so you might decide, you know what, for me, it, my brain just isn't going to go there. Maybe you just use a little small little block of blue with a, a relative humidity graph and you don't use it in the background. But this is a way to explore how might I connect relative humidity to these this dry vegetation and the relative humidity based on the color of the sky. It might be too much, but it's it's part of exploring it, of experimenting. How do I um, take these different ways of expressing data uh, into my observations. So this is one that um, I'm still torn on. I haven't reprogrammed my brain to see the dark blue as dry, but I might. So it's it's you kind of have to work through it. Yeah. So are you currently at the point where your brain, when you look at this, your brain sees dark blue and you think dry? No. <laughs> not not yet. Okay. So as as. Um, I'm, I'm glad we're both in the same boat, um, but I really like the idea. I really like the idea. Yeah, and but isn't I, it interesting how symbols get ingrained in us? Blue means water. Mm -hmm. 
that's 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 interesting. I wonder how deep that goes. Oh, this is really fun. Um, and also, folks, wait, wait, let's back back up one more time. I just take a look, folks, at the at the notes that are written with these. Look at all the senses that are coming in here. Feels soft and bends. Feels dry, but it bends. Smells like straw. Right? Uh, feels and smells moist. Feels like vinyl. Feels like fabric. Some crackling. I. This is fun. This is really fun. Mm, 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 mm. Um, thank you. Let's let's bump over to the, the, the next one. These are just so rich. Like I, I wanted, there's several things that kind of my brain was, I wanted to, to pick your brain about here. So one is talk to me a little bit more about this circle diagram. You, you I kind of got a sense that this is a strategy that you use for a lot of things. And what kind of things do you use them for? Um, and what is this one specifically representing? like circles or processes or kind of a, a cycle whether it's a change in the season which so this one is cured grass percent cured grass because that's one of the key observations for the fire environment is how much of it is dried out and that will change the fire hazard and risk level so um but i don't always want to sketch all the vegetation like i think the next one is more of the sketches of the changes so i might just want to do and i could sometimes this will be a very small tiny little graph but i i put an arrow on it just because it's kind of a process and sometimes it's a complete circle of how i might do it but this one i just kind of wanted to open um and kind of thinking of the amount of it that's colored in how much is still green versus how much of it is dry it gives me a Mm. a visual sense of the percent of the grass that's dry in that area versus how much of it is still green got it so this is you're looking at of the grass in this area how much is brown how much is is new and green mm -hmm. and then you can put different things into that little circle scale depending on what you're measuring yeah and then you're looking at um also this this, this cool kind of texture of the grass um, of these 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 dried grasses here that over to the left you, I see that grass arching over it you're looking at where it's frayed and I'm guessing also here really looking at the diameters of these things as that has also an impact on on ability to catch fire mm -hmm. yeah um, tell us about the the horizontal fuels diagram there yeah I so in fire. Uh, and that, I guess that's part of trying to simplify the data you're looking at, what you're looking at. Um, how fire spreads um, is very much based on what's on the ground and so the, the carrying fuels. And so I like to do a very simple diagram, just kind of in general, how much vegetation is on the ground and where it's going to spread. And uh, sometimes it's just a, a color how much of the area is colored in is grass and it might be green or yellow for dry um i can do little different size circles for bushes sometimes i'll use triangles for trees but i'm kind of trying to look at this continuity of vegetation over a space and it just rather than trying to draw a bunch of trees and other stuff it doesn't necessarily give me at a bird's eye view an idea of the ground the surface vegetation and then I also very frequently with this do a, a vertical uh, cross section diagram to show how fire will move then up into higher vegetation. So comparing the tallness of the grass with the where does it reach the shrubs, where do the shrubs reach the tree branches, so I could see how fire would move vertically. So I, those are quick. They're things that I want to do all the time, but I don't want to take a lot of time in it. So I'm almost always just doing a diagram. So, so in this one, I'm seeing kind of yellow and green together across the whole thing. So there are grasses that are covering the whole thing. Yeah, um, grass. And then scattered it. trees and a bush. Yep, and then a little bit of green. So it's mostly kind of dead grass with a yep. few little green patches coming up. So then that dead grass might carry that fire from, even though the trees aren't super close together, that could, if, 
if there's uh, low branches, then that fire would get over to all those other trees. Yeah, but I would represent the low branches in that cross section mm. diagram. Yeah. So this is just yeah. to represent how things spread horizontally. Oh, that's really fun. This is this is this is just oh, oh and there's the, there's your humidity thing. So yeah. in your little humidity diagram up there in the corner, um, was that is the high and the low um that day or the uh, the the average for the place you are or the highest and lowest um it depends on how i'm wanting to think about it this was a actual workshop i was putting on so i wasn't going to be visiting this area over and over so it was just for the day the context of the when i was there it was 44% but throughout the day um, it changed the high and low on that. And so I kind of tried to visualize that a little differently. Um, then I have the raindrop. So it's, to me, it's a moisture, not just the blue, but a moisture sort of thing. Um, but if I was looking at an environment I'm at all the time and wanting to compare how that might be from a climate change sort of way or some other more complex system. So it kind of depends on how I want to look at the environment, the context of the day, the season um, within a climate change. So that could, I could do that differently based on how I want to look at it. I, I really like what, when you're doing your introduction, you're talking about when you're getting numbers, you're not just getting a number in uh, isolation, you're getting it in relevance to trends and thresholds and, and, and ranges of, of things so that um, I, and I see that up there in that humidity thing. So you're thinking of where are things right now, but just a number like this is 42. That's really different than saying this is rapidly rising. Mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so what is a number in context? You're really intentional about numbers in context. I look over on the left page, there's temperature and your numbers are in context again. Oh, very cute with a little thermometer behind the thing. <laughs> I see what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. I don't see this is this is this is gives is so instructional about how to think. So numbers, everybody, numbers, not just a number, not just a number, but how can I make that number in context? This is really fun. Let, let, let's bump over to the next page. Let's see. Oh yeah. So, so this, yeah, and and again in context sort of how are things relative to to other to 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 the other states what where are we in the story of what's going on here yeah and the, so this you know simplifying can help you see trends so i don't want to draw you know that oh just this little tiny area has dried but most of it's green it's like no i want to look from all green to just 10%. And how do I represent that, that we're still in this range? So kind of simplifying those data points, those data ranges or thresholds in a simple way that you're kind of looking at a phase versus the exact little details. So it's yeah. kind of trying to find a way to represent that. Yes, that's the idea here. Simplifying helps you find and, and reveal trends. You're not, you're not then lost in all the little minutia of jiggles and jaggles, but you're getting those trends. That is critically important. Oh, this is cool. Let, let's bounce to the next one. And oh, yeah, we will give everybody time. Uh, I hope we'll have time for some everybody to, to, to pepper you with questions here. But my, my mind is just so blown by this. Um, and what I love that you're saying here is that you don't have to do this. Like I was thinking like, like oh, how would you keep this up forever? No, you don't have to. But you mentioned when you're doing this that you were you were making these um, these these charts for you know maybe a month or two, and in that time that refined your thinking about these sorts of things and helped you sort of uh, think about patterns that. Um, you otherwise wouldn't see that this exercise then brought you to thinking about how our insects were responding to the temperatures 
and kind of crazy that you uh, you happen to be there for breaking one of those records too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these sometimes data can, you know, it doesn't always feel as fun or creative as a, just a sketch, but it's such a different way to see and relate to things. And so, you know, I like to do a lot of this at least once, you know, but pick the right time. You may not just want to do one for uh, just a random, you know, just the one first month in spring or summer, you might want to think of, no, I want that transition. What what time of year will I see things start to emerge or make that change? And so um, if finding, thinking about when you want to see the changes, uh, it can help make these more useful. That's fun. Did you also get a low temperature record? Um, Bottom right hand corner. Let's see. No, I'm trying to remember why I circled that one. Oh, yes, actually, there was. Yes, I see that. Yes, there was a. That might have been another record. I think my writing sloppy, I think, it was originally a 34 and it was a 32. So there was a low record as well. Yes. Right. Uh, this is this is this is how to change your brain. And then you've got um, okay, the 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 num words, pictures, and numbers. They each get our brain to interact with this on a different way. Everybody, look at how all these ideas are integrated. All right. Um, there we go. <laughs> right. There's there's a box of words on on the right hand side. Um, there's there are numbers, and then the numbers are recorded in pictures and the original numbers are recorded. And then you've got the butterflies and bees coming out um, where you see all those, 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 those moments. So this is just, this is your brain on paper. <laughs> um, oh yeah. And so here we see your same color, your same color scheme and how you use that throughout. Right. But pop over to the next one here. Oh, this was interesting. I, th this idea of showing the water upside down. Mm -hmm. I imagine that as sort of water sinking deeper into the soil in my brain. Yeah. But instead of a, it's your high points mean there's more water seeping in. So I personally like it as an inverted graph instead of the way it normally is shown. This, you just you are you're thinking outside of the of the box here. This is really fun to see, and then uh, also kind of uh, the the idea that you sat down and you diagrammed a real section of tree trunk, and then worked to correlate that with what you were seeing. With are those fire scars um, yeah. in the inset? Mm -hmm. Where, where this thing has been in fires, where they're tighter together. Uh, the world needs more thinking like this. Turn your water upside down. <laughs> and if I, um, in the green swatch in the middle, tree ring samples uh, across the forest area to analyze climate and fire trends. Um, are those, if we're able to zoom in on those, were, are those actual different samples from different places? No, I didn't get a chance. I was just trying to convey the, the concept that uh, different those would be different tree yeah. ring samples within there looking at it. So no, I just had had the one event because it's kind of hard if you don't know when the tree was cut to then backward count yeah. to the age of it. Um, so... Uh, or the dates. You can do the age, but you wouldn't know what years, and that makes it hard to correlate with um, the climate. But you could still age the tree by the, the rings, but you wouldn't exactly know what years unless you knew when it cut was cut, and that allowed me to do the, the climate with it. Um, it's also interesting to see by having a larger section of cut wood um, that there are some places in the same um, little uh, in, in the same year growth that are wider and thinner. And if you're just using an increment bore to kind of drill in and get a little tube, you would miss that. Yeah, that 
the tree and what kind of slope it's on or if it's pressed close to another tree it will change the width within that same year so you that same year could have variable widths just based on some other things going and that's that allows you to ask more questions about oh but, or even look for if you know you know maybe there was a big tree next to it before is there a stump or was there a bunch of shrubs or so it, it allows you to look at more things and what that relates to that tree's growth so rich and again folks this idea of just taking taking your graph and flipping it upside down makes water more intuitive in this i i, I think that's really interesting i would I would, I would have, I've seen so many graphs with, you know, water the same way, more water. Um, but this, this visually is also just so appealing. And that's the next one is the same inverted yeah. sort of rain, but it has the climate compared to the current year. So you're kind of looking at where did your current year fit within um, that overall climate for that season, that month. And then you can overlay what's happening, seeing if different things are happening within high moisture or dry periods. Um, you can mm -hmm. kind of try to relate your observations to that weather element. Really good way to this. This, yeah, you really get the sense of the water soaking in in these different places. Really useful. Okay. Let's. Okay, now. So this is this is where this is so some of these pictures that we're looking at these are uh, visuals that you had done later on an iPad. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing with Procreate. Yeah. And then here we're looking into the journal page itself. Mm -hmm. um, what I want people to think about as um, as you're looking at this is how much information your brain can hold at once when you're trying to kind of keep it inside your head in between your ears. And by creating this integrated diagram and using symbols, Miriam is able to create, um, you think of a typical graph as having two dimensions, right? You're gonna have something on your X and your Y axis. Well, let's think about just how many axes are going on here. One axis is time. Another, uh, so time through the month. Another axis of this is time, day and night. Another axis is temperature. Another is moisture. Another is wind speed. Another is um, satellite hotspot fires. Um, another is uh, these emerging wildfires. Another is an active wildfires. Wildfires. Um, and oh, the little arrow symbols. Tell us about the arrow symbols. Is that wind speed? The chevrons. Yeah, that's yeah. wind speed. Uh huh. Ah, see. Oh yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, wind speed. Um, so all of these, when we look at this, we can start to see like, oh, what is the relationship between where there are active fires and wind speed? Huh. Look at that. Right. Um, you know, you just patterns emerge to us. Patterns emerge to us. This is so much fun. You know, it's interesting kind of um, early June during some of those um, fires where the uh, or the 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 nighttime temperatures were, nighttime temperatures were cooler. There wasn't as much moisture around in those places. So the, and other places where the nighttime temperatures were warmer and some of those instances there, there was more, uh, more, uh, more, more moisture. It's interesting sort of to see like, you, you know, I can look at this and kind of go like, oh, there's an interesting pattern. Oh, there's an interesting pattern. Oh, there's an interesting pattern. This is really I, cool. I, I like this visual and I like the stem and leaf things coming off of it uh, because you could just connect so many different things with those symbols and see, try to see patterns. Yes, 
Yeah. And I saw where you use that strategy another place in a really interesting way. Um, but look at, so just think about this, folks, in terms of how many variables can be present in a graphic and it still makes sense. That's amazing to me. And you're also, you you this isn't, um, Edward Tufte is a person who studies the visual display of um, quantitative information. And there's something that you'll see on a lot of, you know, like um, US News and World Reports graphs and things where they put, they kind of put in a whole bunch of irrelevant stuff that looks pretty, but doesn't contribute to information. You are also here being really rigorous about there's not irrelevant stuff on here. There's really useful stuff on here. Everything is a very deliberate decision. Um, I think Tufty would be proud of you. Thank you. And this, but, so I guess I would say that this is a process that there were a whole bunch of different graphs with a lot of irrelevant data that I experimented with. And then but I, I wouldn't have learned kind of where to come to what seemed most relevant to see these patterns if I hadn't experimented with a number of different types of data and information of like, oh, I don't understand what's going on. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so just deciding what to take out, what what can be the most simple and and how to layer in the other ones that are most relevant. But it it took experimentation. And I so I usually brainstorm and just think about what to me seems like it makes sense, maybe do a little looking it up, experiment with, you know, half a dozen different visual ways, and then attempt to put it together with the data. So it, it, it's kind of a process, and then you find something that really works for you, and it's a lot more rewarding. So, dear friends, you heard it here, growth mindset in data visualizations. So Miriam is willing to play with these ideas to modify them and iterate them to get systems that work better and better and better. You don't have to have it right with your first graph, but keep graphing and keep playing with it and your brain will change. Ah, oh, love it. Let, let, let's bounce along. It, is the, um, yeah, the, this, this also sort of reminded me of just like how many different ways you can sort of show information and what are the relationships seeing all these different pieces together, um, what's burnt, day, night, uh, temperatures, humidities, day, night. Um, this is really, really useful. The more that you can sort of see together, and then things are, are kind of, if we look vertically down this, sort of a moment in time, you can sort of see how these things come together. Um, here I wanted everybody just to to underscore and and put a big uh, heart next to this idea of leaning into the part of the Beaufort scale that is the most relevant to you, right? Um, there are some parts of the Beaufort scale that are really relevant to how many sails you should have up in high winds when you're on a sailing ship in the ocean. And those are less relevant to so so Beaufort developed this system for when to put your sails up and down on your sailing ship. But when we kind of take that and we make it relevant to um, to fire ecology, we're looking at 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 um, at different sorts of things. So pay attention to what is meaningful, what is personally meaningful to you. And Love recreate it. it in your own way because uh, you know wind speed you might want to do it for your hiking in a certain environment of like okay here's where i should have a lot more heads up of possible tree branches falling or here's when entire trees may fall on me and mm -hmm. uh, but what's a comfortable cool temperature so you might be doing this for just a whole bunch of different things or watching birds you know you may see different bird activities or um so many different things but just thinking or, about or if i'm out with my children and i'm thinking about how does winds wind chill affect perceived temperature 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Yeah. Pay attention. So, oh, could you talk to us a little bit about your use of transparencies and overlays? This is yeah. an interesting thing. I've never seen people really doing this in their journals before. What are you doing and what's going on here? So, as you notice on that first journal page I shared, I put so much information that it's almost hard to see it because it gets so crowded. And so I was trying to think of, okay, I still want to see information next to each other. I still, I need to see it kind of together. But trying to put it all on, on the main journal page just becomes so crowded. So I started experimenting with vellum paper. You could use tracing paper and just taping it so I could flip it up. Um, and then, so I, I'm able to kind of see these layers of data together that I want to see. And so, um, yeah, so I just basically kind of think about what do I want on the main page? That's kind of the main observation. And for me, when I'm thinking of situational awareness, like training myself to look at how things change over time of like, okay, I'm experiencing pretty light winds, but past winds and based on the shape of the trees there, and that's using the Griggs Putnam wind deformation index can tell you wind speeds based on- There's such a thing. Yeah. And so it can tell you, well, in the past, there's been winds of you know about this wind speed um and then there's a lot of other i have in my book a, a table with different types of wind that you'll experience different times of day of upslope downslope up valley down valley based on storms and so and there are pretty common uh, wind speed ranges of okay that's a three to six mile per hour type of wind and i could expect it at that time of day the sea breeze the land breeze and so if you have that kind of information to reference you can predict too based on okay um i'm experiencing that this wind now it could be an indicator of this type of wind and it's this time of day so that helps me confirm it and i can make predictions so i use my um transparency page for my prediction page of like, based on what I've observed, what I could see from past winds and present winds, I'm using the transparency for a prediction. Nice. That's really fun. So um, makes me want to carry just a little bit of tape um, and some, a few sheets of vellum that I could tape in. It also makes me think that it wouldn't be interesting to keep just a few little pieces of paper to make um, to make sort of pop up or or lift the flap things in my journal. This kind of layered thinking, I I wonder how that would change the way we interact with with a phenomena. That's Ooh. that's really cool. Um, let's bounce over to the, the 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 next. This is really this is neat. And that's kind of a lot of complicated information, but it, again, it's just using a table and spreading your data out in different categories by column and row and showing observations related to those is, is another way to kind of separate out and think about it by creating columns and tables. Yeah, the, so the the structure of this, yeah, that, that that's a really good point. That if this were sort of scattered all over the page, our brain could not take it in. But by the 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 intersecting uh, rows and columns, this allows us to um, have a chance at grasping this this information together. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. give ourselves a little more structure. That might be hard to come up with on the fly when you're starting to put things into your journal. Um, but just sort of to us to remember how to. And I do think a lot of this would be things that like at the end of a month, or the end of the year, look back through your observations and re-envision it. So this could be just, you know, what can I, how can I categorize what I've already observed 
and then that might draw you into now I want I missed some periods of observation so I'm going to create a template like prompts for me to go in and fill this in and get a, a bigger idea but I think it's sometimes it's pre-work that helps you think about putting your observations in so you might pre-set this up or you're looking through your observations and re-envisioning them I think yeah Let's bounce over to the next. Yeah, same here. This, yeah, the, 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 so here you're thinking you've got stuff from the field, and every once in a while you go back and you do big picture diagrams to help you kind of think about um, phenomena. Yeah, at different scales and different things in yeah. maps or pretty common and sometimes for large like weather systems or things I may have just seen clouds but in those clouds maybe moving along a ridge line um but overall where are they moving coming from and where are they going to you know you could portray that on a map and the changes um, over seasons or something so map how do, yeah how does what we're seeing tie into larger scale phenomenon it's easier for us to see on one small specific scale but we want to train ourselves to think on larger scales, uh, both uh, larger and smaller scales. Uh, in um, uh, science education in the United States, one of the things that uh, science teachers are trying to get students to do is to think about the relevance of, of scale on what you're observing and the phenomena that you're interacting with. And I love how you really zoom out there. So is, is this then a chart that you would make in advance and then fill in as a template? That's what I was thinking. A ridge came up with it. But I think you could do this a kind of um, fill in after the fact. If you kind of the you could yeah. organize the little calendars in there and then fill in the observations later. So this could be a follow-up the end of the year, uh, kind of a way to conceptualize time in different ways of a changing landscape versus I could have put data or something on the little calendars, which I didn't do. I left it blank, but I originally thought oh, I'd probably mark a few points of this is when I saw something or something. And so it's different layers of ways of seeing it, but it could be a prompt, like do it beforehand. And this is what I hope to see, mm -hmm. or it could be after the fact, I think, and fill in the sketches after. With a question with the, the organization of these, I see January, February, March are doing kind of a V, a sideways V towards the top. And then the rest are kind of going around counterclockwise. What was the thinking behind the organization of how those months are laid on the page? <laughs> um, I don't know if it exactly works part of it was just spacing of how to fit all those calendars in there and part of it was where the, like those things that i'm observing they might all lump into three months versus it might just be over you know so kind of where am i seeing the changes for that little path so it's kind of i want the path but what fits kind of in that area of those spring conditions versus summer and the transition periods but it was kind of more haphazard of just actually physically fitting it on the page, but also kind of thinking about um, the trends and observations could clump them together. So it's it's kind of a mix, but more haphazard than anything. That's good. Let's pop over to the. Oh, okay, so is that is the outside shape here the shape of a county? Yes, that's Butte County. Yes. Butte, uh, so this is Butte County. So a block diagram made in the shape of Butte County, and oh, there's Paradise, the one that got hit by those major fires right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, I've seen block diagrams, but I've never seen one based on a county before. This is really cool. I like that. Um, so it just makes me think about the shape of, and then having the, block diagrams interspersed with uh, landscape ecos. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Um, uh, and then this is a very accessible 
a very accessible way of doing um, of of doing uh, block diagrams. Sometimes the big sort of three quarter view block is hard to do, but this is this would also be kind of a great way to uh, for people who are starting with block diagrams to be able to do those. And I, what I also like about it is that it gives you space to also use your writing in there in that diagram as well. Yeah, I I, I had struggled in the past, and I struggle in the field with the the block diagrams of the exact landscape. It just feels overwhelming. But again, thinking about well, what is it I want to represent in that more three D perspective? And this one, I just want to see the different vegetation at elevational zones. So I don't have to do the whole landscape. I just want to see a little snippet of it. And so you may just do a little strip of a, um, like this for a landscape, it, depending on what you want to see. If you're wanting all overall topography, you should certainly do a, a, a bigger one. But if you just wanted to see the transitions, do something simple. Yeah, those, those, those three quarter view block diagrams of complex landscape really takes um, some skills. Um, that's that's great. I'll skip past this one. This one's a little complicated, oh, but it's just, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, um, so this one, um, I think it is so, the, the, the sort of, the, the, it, it is a complex thing, but being able to see, uh, The, add, adding the color to it makes the pattern in it easier to spot. Yeah, and instead of just a regular square table, since it, it has to do with a change in moisture or sun exposure based on the time of day and the slope, and it's different based on a steep slope versus a flat slope, you know, why not make a kind of a flatter triangle and a steeper triangle and shift your data instead of the one table with everything which that table is terrible to look at the original and then re-envisioning so, it to two separate so, ones um, um so so in, in in envisioning this i imagine so uh, imagine a four-sided mountain um and you want and one is tall and uh, not very steep. The other, or one is one is steep and one is not steep. So there are two mountains here, and we're trying to show the north, the south, the east, and the west facing slopes of this. And so what we've done is taken that mountain and flipped it out into this big tie, tie this this big sort of diagram. And so you're looking at the higher you go on the mountain, um, the, uh, so this is, this is, is, is interesting, sort of high on the mountain, um, is, is, so is zero, I'm very dry? Yes. And a high number is, I'm rather moist. Based on it's, but it's just that like there's an additional number you add. It has nothing to do with the other relative. It just has to do with sun exposure's influence on drawing. And so um, this there's an additional number, and you would add to your relative humidity and other stuff. So this is like an additive number based on sun exposure. That the more direct sun you're getting in an area will cause more drying. And so the zero means you don't have any additional moisture or shading and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a direct sun exposure influence on yeah. the, sh the sh drying and shading sort of thing. But it, to me, uh, it kind of helped. Is, is more moisture up towards the top of these? Is that because you might be up in a place where there are more clouds? Well, so that's where this one struggles. It's um, time of day, the height of each of them. It's just the shape of it gives an idea if that's a one, the steep one is a, a slope with 30%, you know, 30% or more, one is 30% or less, but the, the rings are time of day. So it first thing in the morning on a fairly flatter slope, it's still pretty moist. Oh, and so it's a time of oh, so day this thing. This isn't elevation going up. It's no, it's, it's different. 
it's time going a period. And so this was the first exploration. I might explore a different table version of this, but um, I was experimenting with instead of a table with all of that data all in one table, you know, separating by slope that is flatter slope. And so I can see that, hey, on a, a flatter slope, the sunlight in the afternoon is pretty even across each aspect because that's flat. <laughs> it's, oh, it's flatter. So you get the sun so across in a higher, steeper slope. You'll see that at a certain time of day, a certain aspect gets much more strong sun exposure. So this is just time of day and sun exposure. Okay, so this this is a diagram that is typically used then by firefighters. Yeah. That you did not invent, but you're working. Yeah. You're looking at how can I make this just this graphic that there that that firefighters are already exposed to make a little more sense. Could I take another stab at trying to understand it? Yeah, and theirs was just a table. They didn't have a, like a triangular. It's just a it just a, was a square table with rows with all okay. of this. It, so I separated into two uh, and tried to visualize it more. So my top one, I'm not steep sloped, uh, less than thirty percent. The the lower one, I'm on a mountain face that is um, is. Uh, is is steeper sloped. Mm -hmm. There are four sides of my mountain mm -hmm. facing north, south, east, and west. And I'm not thinking of kind of going down. I'm thinking as I slide down the mountain, what I'm actually doing is I'm sliding through time. Mm -hmm. So if I am on a steep mountain in the morning and I'm sitting on the south facing slope, um, it's going to be fairly moist in the morning, and then it quickly kind of gets dry, but doesn't get completely dry. And then towards the afternoon, the humidity starts to come back up as I sit in that one place. Am I understanding it correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. So the height of the diagram is time. Oh, so this is, it's fun to think about, like, how can you take anything and visually represent that and to play with those? And is it, but it's also interesting to think about our assumptions where when I see a little mountain like this, I automatically assumed that height must be elevation. Just like when I see dark blue, I think, dark blue must mean more um, greater humidity. Yeah, uh, and that's, I think, the fun thing about exploring data viz yeah. visualization is that you see where your assumptions are, but then you might also realize, but that's something I have to face and that other people probably do as well, so maybe I'll try a different visual. But until you explore it, you don't see those biases and you don't find what works or what's unique until you kind of explore some different approaches to looking at the data. But it is fun to think of this as a as a four-sided mountain then folded out. Yeah. That's cool. Ah. Right. Yeah. Look at the power of these block diagrams to help us visualize these, these motions. Love that. And this one's kind of was challenging over long periods of time. I was still not 100% sure if I feel like it works, but you know, there's the baseline landscape and different vegetation kind of communities in there. And e each of those vegetation communities um, would typically have fires at a certain frequency. And so I kind of brought them up that one of them has pretty frequent fires. So like, you know, in 10 years and 20 years, 30 years, it would have had fires. And then, you know, one is kind of midway. You missed the next one because I didn't go that high on the, the far left. And then the middle one's kind of the longest, like, you know, far periods of time before it would have another fire. This is historical fire return stuff. Mm -hmm. So you could do a similar one on, like, comparing the old frequency of fire in an area to a current one. But this was an attempt to look at how fire behaves in different ecosystems. Oh, I see. And so then each one of these little patches then comes and sits down over that little landscape that's below. Yeah. 
Oh, that's that's a cool way of thinking about things. Yeah. I, so folks, notice that, notice these vertical lines. We'll come back to this, I think, fairly soon. Trying to say that this fits into this little place here. If you have a drawing or an, an icon that is floating above a map, above a three-quarter view map, it is hard to tell people where that fits down in the landscape. So, but because that, say that middle one, that line comes down towards the back there, you can be like, oh, I see that that one is going to fit down into there. And then maybe, I think it might be the next slide. Oh, no, it's not. Um, it's where, where we get to. Um, let's, let's fast forward to where you're doing the acoustic landscapes. Right, the next. There, All right. So, folks, take a look at these um, these these vertical lines on the left on these maps. So, what we're she's showing here is that let's take a look at that low complexity, low severity one. There's that vertical line on the left with a red spot and a blue spot on it, right? Um, and what that's saying is that. At that spot right there, there is there's a little songbird, and I guess that songbird then flew over to the other place. Um, yes. So and they're saying, why not just put the spot on the ground? Well, let's say you've got multiple things in that area. Like look at the low complexity, low severity. One year later, there's a whole bunch of bees and and the little songbirds moving around. All of those are over there. How would you, could you put that in without getting your graph too complicated? These vertical lines that terminate down on that flat map, map surface show you where this little piece fits in. And so that's a neat strategy in a three-dimensional graph to show where things are on that surface, right? So that's that's a, that's a, a, a useful a useful thing here. Um, and, I, and I wasn't trying to go like the exact pinpoint location, but it's by the severity type. So there's a you know a patch of a certain condition, and they might have been you know somewhere kind of in that general area, but it's not trying to pinpoint exact on a map but the little pinpoint is in general, you're seeing all these things in that condition or that habitat type. Right. You could try to be specific, but I wanted to simplify to just, they're in this area, but they actually, some of them move over into this other type of habitat. And so okay. trying to connect habitat types or fire severity types. And if you wanted to show their exact location, you could using this exact method. You could, although then you wouldn't, you'd have a lot of, it might become too complicated maybe rather than all the vertical lines. So you'd probably have to play with it to see. Yeah, I've seen some of these lines that come down to, um, in, in a three-dimensional graph, there will often, like there's, if there's a, flo a point floating above a three-dimensional graph with an X, Y, and Z axis, they very, it will often use one of these lines that comes down to show you on the X and Y axis where that point comes in. Um, so in my brain, I'm kind of visualizing that, that into this. This is really fun. Um, now, oh, go ahead. Um, I, um, uh, let, let's back up just a little bit. More. Oh, look at all of these. Look at this, this, the senses that are coming here. Fire acoustics, right? What are all the sounds that you make with, with, like we we don't have a vocabulary for this. We don't really have really good ways of thinking about it. I love all of these. It reminds me of to describe these, 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 these the sounds of this. Oh, oh, this is so rich. So I've got, um, I've been monopolizing all of our time here. And there's a 
Um, in the next 15 minutes, I know there's a bunch of people here who um, also have a lot of questions for you. And I, um, oh, maybe, maybe before we do, just bounce over to that circle graph, the three, the three circles there. So here, higher up is a higher elevation. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at, um, and the circle is not north, south, east, west. The circle is seasonal. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at where in summer, all right, so in my late summer at high elevation, I'm getting fires. This just sort of reminds me of uh, the, the, the importance of, of kind of labeling our axes um, in communicating what we, what we do. The graph works as long as I don't assume that these are directions. But this also could be done for different directions with this, this same. Absolutely. I was trying to find us and using a circle as the cycle in some yeah. ways because I the different, yeah. you know, quarters of a season. That's that's really cool. Um and also uh bonus points for your little fire line has a little orange glowing edge around it. I like that. <laughs> um let's let's uh open this up to um the the the, the community here. And what we can do is maybe we um, we can kind of keep you um, uh, with 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 access to um, uh, this, this these slide decks in case people have questions or thoughts or ideas relating to a specific part of this. Um, I would love for people to be able to ask you questions. And there's a couple ways of doing this. You can use the raise hand function, and we'll be looking for your raised hand. Um, you can also um, just turn on your camera and wave at me, and uh, and 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 Avea, and we'll be looking for you. Um, and if nobody has any questions, I've got a bunch more for you. But um, wanted to give um, y'all a chance to uh, interact with our our special guest uh, Miriam here. Um, does anyone have thoughts, comments, questions, or ideas um, about your own data visualization practice? And I'll give a chance for folks to ask their questions live first. And if not, then there's a ton of questions that are in the chat that were not deleted um, to answer Jesse's question. I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand. Um, do you mind if I ask some of the questions from the chat? That would be that would be great. Yes, please. Okay. So, um, so one of the questions um, from earlier was, what sort of um, equipment do you use to gather your measurements of humidity, um, barometric pressure, wind, and and temperatures, and all of that? Just because um, we know that some temper, um, sorry, some some tools are um, are are more reliable than others. And so we were wondering what you use. So, most of the time, I'm just trying to build a scent. So the ex like being super accurate to my location isn't always uh, that important. So I will just, most often I just pull off the regular weather for what I'm using. But I do also, if I do wanna be more specific, I have what's called a Kestrel which is a little weather tool that um, does temperature, wind speed, barometric pressure. I can't, there's a few other things. I don't remember what they are on it, but it's just a little tool. You do a couple little adjustments on and it'll give you all that info at a very much, very specific right where you're kind of thing. So I do have a Kestrel, but a lot of this for me, I'm just wanting to get an idea of trends and I can see the trends even with just weather from a regular, common weather station. Thank you. Um, I, I see Susan Beckhart's hand is raised, so I'm gonna unmute her. Um, I think that that works, does that work? You can unmute? Okay, and then I'm going to add her so that she can ask her question, go ahead. Yeah, I, this, this, 
just mind mind boggling. I love this so much. I, I was just curious how and I know some 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 of the, the visualization techniques that you are using are through sort of established existing techniques that you're using for your purpose. You you know stealing for that purpose. <laughs> um, I'm curious, just like how often do you find yourself having to kind of be creative and like just figure out from scratch how to how to visualize something you don't have a technique for that will work versus how often are you stealing or borrowing techniques that that are, are that that are already kind of well established versus a mix of the two yeah and it, and when you and when you do come up with just like something totally brand new how 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 many false starts do you get because i i find that's just figuring out a new way to visualize a new thing is just is very challenging so that's what i'm getting at yeah very much you know whether it's i like to do a visual kind of search for things for ideas pretty early on in my process usually i'm like there's something i want to observe or understand and i'm thinking okay i want to i want to figure out temperature i want to understand and so i'll go to pinterest or just the web and i'll search for things related to temperature and i might see some visuals that don't mean anything but once in a while i'll see something or i realize that as i'm seeing examples you know what it needs to be more of a of this type of a visual so I'll just in general go okay let me look at um data graphs uh, for weather in general or something but I just I do some general search terms and explore visuals at the same time thinking about how my data and observations will fit into that and I do that for just regular illustration work too that oftentimes I want to do like I just recently did an illustration for a, a fire social scientist in Europe that um, has been studying different types of suffering associated with fire. It's like, oh man, okay, how am I going to visualize that? I don't want to like draw all these people doing stuff. So how can I come up with some symbolic stuff based on suffering and resilience? And so I, you know, I think about different visuals and symbols that might be relevant or graphics and, and look at those and it helps me find tune it and then part just in a like a regular notebook i'll kind of visual just kind of add my notes on the you know on a triangle or whatever i'm doing and think about how my information might flow as so i kind of work it out real primitive and i may throw out ideas right away when i see oh no they're just not going to fit like that i'll have to try a different graph i don't so i don't know if that helps you but i definitely like to find examples for just about anything to see how it was spatially to convey it and then i work through the data uh, very primitive and just a notebook and then when i've after i've written my notes all over the place sometimes it's even just a mind map of here's all my notes oh here's how it might flow i'll use this visual then i so it's, so it's kind of a, a process thanks Thank you for that. highlighting some some questions that have come up earlier in the chat. Just want to note. There's one, and, and I saw and I saw your response to the Susan, so I really appreciated um, your response. Jesse had asked um, for Miriam. She says, "I'm curious what your advice would be for people who don't have opportunity opportunities to experience live fire to connect to the felt slash embodied experience of fire as an earth process." Are there ways we can connect to fire through journaling without experiencing live fire? Yes, thank you, Jesse. Um, the again, fire is not a, a, a just a, like a living thing, like an animal. It's a chemical reaction, and in order for to understand a chemical reaction, you have to know the ingredients, and that's why looking at those environmental elements before a fire ever starts. Uh, people that have experience with fire, my husband and I both, we can walk around, you know, a landscape and both of us go, oh, this place, you know, needs fire, but you wouldn't want to have it in these conditions. And, you know, this place would just torch or this place would be really great, beautiful fire. Um, but we, we know what 
the the height of the grass and how you know concentrated things are and the temperatures and there's all these embodied things and so it's a practice of in my pyrosketchology book which i have the free chapters and electronic version on my website i have all these through all those pre-fire the the weather the the vegetation the amount of slope when you kind of learn what data to key into and observe that over time and kind of do these journaling practices like using colors to connect with temperature you start to embody what fire would be like without ever seeing it and then ideally you find opportunities where a lot of places are doing prescribed fires whether it's tribes or other organizations and i think i'm hoping there'll be a growing opportunities for people to go and and nature journal about that that's kind of what i try to promote and see that that's an opportunity so um yeah you don't have to actually see fire but it will make it more relevant once you have been doing the regular environment stuff and then you have an opportunity to actually see fire there are satellites um that uh, or webcams i should say where you can often watch fires across the landscape there are quite a few of those around the us so that's another way to maybe see live fire in action it won't be quite as useful as more in person so I don't know if that answered it well enough or if, if there's more that Jesse wanted to ask. Could I, could I add to that? Mm -hmm. um, in the resources that you're putting together, you have a lot of materials and have done a lot of thinking about how to interact with fire in a landscape before a fire, during a fire, and after a fire. You have lots of materials and lots of thoughts on this sort of pre, uh, during, and post fire. Mm -hmm. Um, in a landscape, and uh, you know, after fire, how to read the story of the fire um, before the fire, how to understand the history of a place from the perspective of of fire, and during a fire, how not to get burned, but um, how to explore in that environment and learn in that moment as well. Uh, the, the 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 first priority is your safety, um, and then and, and uh, those of, of, of others around you. And then with that taken care of, there's a lot that we can learn in that moment as well. Um, but those, uh, we'll put a link to uh, uh, pirate sketchology, which people are turning into pirate sketchology, which is, <laughs> I love. Um, the, uh, that is, uh, so you, you have a lot of materials that are really relevant to that and, and useful. Yeah, yeah. And I have tried to tease out very specific exercises and approaches to journaling it to get that more full bodied. And if this is um, Jesse Thorson, um, she has a fire background and specialist in nature journals. And she also is looking at how to use music um, to create music with observations, if this is the Jesse that I'm thinking of. And um, we might brainstorm and at some point I'd love to have with Jack if Jesse and maybe a bigger group want to talk about crossover integrating other creative techniques to um, create this full body relationship of observations. That sounds extremely interesting. I think a bunch of us would be interested. And yes, this is this is the Jesse you're thinking of and she says thank you. Um, do you mind um, if um, do we have time for a couple more questions or no? I, I don't want to be, I want to be respectful of your time. It's Jack's platform though. Oh, um, Miriam, a couple, a couple more questions. Does that sound good? Sure. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. I'll try to make them um, really good ones then. Um, so there was um, one question about if there's going to, if you and Robin at all are planning to do any more like in the field um things where we go out and we get to um watch controlled burns and take notes um the treks thing i think you mentioned is are there any plans for any future outings like that we set plans um before when i did that i was a government employee so i had more control over um i'm gonna take my earbuds out we 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 we're having a hard time hearing you. I'll put it back on my battery. My earbuds are going dead. Um, so I don't have any scheduled at the moment, but I do try to keep an ear out for it. 
And so I hope in the future, more organizations will offer it. I'm not sure where to share or post. And if I get involved in that, I will definitely announce it through the um, Nature Journal Club. But I think people can seek that out themselves. If you look up in your local area, do they have any prescribed fire or prescribed burn associations? Um, a lot of those websites, they have, um, you know, those are for public people to go and engage with fire more. And so I, I think that some of them would be um, likely open to people observing and journaling about that. But I don't have anything scheduled just yet. Okay, well, we'll keep our eyes open. And, and thank you so much for the for the work that you've done with all of this. And um, okay, one, one more question from Pennant. Pa, pa, I always say your name wrong, and I really apologize for this. From Pennant. Nena and Alex, and I want to learn how to say your beautiful name correctly. Um, they ask, do you ever use drones to get a wider overhead view of an area? Yes. My husband has a little small, reasonable priced drone that we use for just videos, and I'll we'll, then I can use that to kind of get an idea. Um, I know the government in my position, drones have been used. I actually use more often for myself. I'll use Google Earth and you can kind of create a 3D mode and look at the landscape at a bigger scale. So I use that all the time to kind of set a larger landscape. And I use webcams. There are a lot of webcams to see a landscape at a bigger scale. So I use those more than my, I guess, because if I'm playing with a drone and doing that, um, uh, there's a, a bit of time and doing, it does catch great video and I'd probably think about doing it more, but for the most part, I'm I'm using those online tools that I um, can reference and direct other people to because I'm kind of trying to show how other people can do it, and I don't want to have too many costs, so I try to find the free op options that people other people could use. I really deeply appreciate that that you're trying to model how we can learn this kind of thing, and so thank you for sharing your tools and your techniques with us. In addition to all of the cool stuff that you found out, and my very final question. Do you see fire trauma awareness and training as becoming important for us to have a wider awareness of and practice as educators and nature journalers and people working with the public? Oh, absolutely. I, um, there's a lot of social science that's been around for a while about um, trauma and how that influences how we listen, how we learn, how we respond, um, how we adapt. And so if we don't think about how trauma impacts us and the people around us, they're not going to be receptive and learning and doing it. And it can be kind of a painful, complicated process. And so, yes, I think that's a, a lot of, I, I've worked a lot with, and I've done with Jack before workshops that include some people that are more social scientists and know about the trauma. So I frequently try to partner with those folks to address um, how do we think about trauma more? But I think that, climate change, people get so overwhelmed and you almost kind of shut down to it. And how do you see that? And how do you kind of connect with the land in a more positive, resilient way? Um, whether it's fire or not, I think there are just complexities that can be traumatic, but we don't want to not learn and, and observe and connect with nature. So I think the more educators can think about how do we explore visuals and approaches that address trauma, I think it's powerful. Thank you. Miriam, I'm so glad and grateful uh, to you for coming on and talking to us a little bit about your process and a little about the way you think about things. Um, the way that you, you, you visualize all these processes can be adapted for us in a million different ways. And the, the work that you've done on this is it's just, it's elegant, it's really useful, and, and this is fantastic. Um, the, if people want to follow more of your work, pyrosketchology.com is a, a, an amazing website where you put together a bunch of your resources. And um, I really want to see this come out in a, uh, in a in a in a in a beautifully published and distributed book, um, and want to you know continue to 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 look for that and fight for that. 
Um, Avea, thank you so much for your help today in um, uh, uh, wrangling all the logistics of, 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 of running these meetings and uh, the, the finding those questions in the, in the comment section there. Um, I'm grateful to both of you. Um, want to encourage everybody who's watching this to use, think about these strategies, not in the context just of, were I doing something about a fire making that specific graph, but about how can I use some of these ideas, let them in and then turn them into something else and let something else creative come out of that. Um, and uh, there's lots and lots of wonderful ideas here. Um, Miriam, do you have any last comments or, or, or thoughts for the community before we wrap? Um, if you don't feel like enough questions were addressed, I don't know if eBay or somebody has the ability to copy them or send them to me or some way for me, and I can find a way to send it to eBay or, or J uh, Jack to, um, to have responses. If that, there's a way to do that, I'm happy to double check the messages. I can, um, if if you need me to, you might already have the chat, but if not, let me know and I can send you the chat or any of the questions within the chat. And then um, whatever answers you give, we can put them in the description of, of this workshop when we post it up to Jack's YouTube and website, if that would be agreeable. So I'm not sure when I get out of Zoom, if I'll still have access to oh, the chat. I okay. guess that's where I'm wondering how to well, capture awesome. them. I can give it to you. I have it. Okay. <laughs> and also, if anybody wanted to save the chat, um, at the bottom of the chat, there's a little there's a little happy face down there, and there's a oh, it smiles when okay. you roll over save it. Chat. Um, there's a format thing, a an emo little emoji thing, and then there's also a little ellipsis. If you click on that ellipsis, the one at the top says save chat, and that will then be saved to your own device. Uh, if anybody ever wants to save any of the chats in any of these meetings, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, grateful to um, the community. Thank you for being here. Um, again, Avea, thank you so much for your support. Miriam, your insight and wisdom is so powerful. And uh, you blew my mind with how to, to think about visualizing information. Thank you. We love your brain. We love you. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you Thank all. You. We'll see you again soon. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.